Hello and welcome to an introduction to philosophy of religion and also talking about the relationship between philosophy itself as discipline and religious studies. So the beginning of this PowerPoint is included in the introduction to logic video, uh, so please take a look at that if you'd like, but we're going to start off presuming that you have taken a look at those introductory videos and are now moving on to here. So a reminder, right, when we're talking about giving arguments in philosophy, we are not talking about just arguing or fighting with each other, but we are talking about giving reasons to think that something is the case. And so in that respect, right, philosophy is a very large discipline, talking about lots of different things, and so we're going to get a better conception of what philosophy of religion does. So some of the questions, right, this is not by all means exhaustive, but some of the primary questions that the discipline of philosophy of religion talks about include the nature and existence of God, so not only whether or not a God or many gods exist, but if a God or gods exist, what is that being like? And the idea there is that this could happen, right, or we could get this information from a number of different sources. Uh, we'll learn more about that later on, but the idea is that perhaps just pure reason could lead us to understand what God is like, or a more common understanding is that there is some sort of religious experience that could give us a sense of what God is like, or give us that sort of di divine knowledge. And because religious experience ends up being such an important source of support for believing in God or what God is like, we need to understand how we should treat religious experience because uh, many people will be inclined to treat them differently from other experiences, right? So we might think that in general you need to have empirical evidence to support, you know, a belief that something is or is not the case. Yet, when someone is having a supposed religious experience that cannot be backed up with empirical evidence, we might be inclined to think that, that there's a special set of circumstances that we want to apply there. As a result of the uh, proliferation of religious experience used to bolster uh, not just areas in philosophy of religion, but religious doctrine more generally, Philosophy of religion also involves um, analyses of religious language and text. So I think the most um, informative contemporary examples of this involve issues in feminist philosophy of religion, right? For example, what are we to make of the fact that God is often described using masculine or male pronouns? What does that mean not only for our conception of God, which you know, independently of gender is actually supposed to be a disembodied being, right? So to limit God by placing any human pronouns on them, right, seems sort of counterintuitive. But then also, again, what impact does that language have on how we then view human beings, right? Um, if we engender God in a particular way, does that prioritize the gender that is closest to God over a gender that is not associated with God? Right? Or similarly, if we're dealing with uh, religions that have many gods, right? what do we make of the fact that some of those gods have one gender, some of them are agender, some of them have a different gender, others might be uh, maybe less anthropomorphic, right? less described in human terms, and maybe associated more with animals or other types of uh, living entities in the world. Additionally, right, looking at the language in the texts, we also have to look conceptually at potential inconsistencies, right? So um, if God is meant to be all-knowing in one respect, but that is then is described in another part of a religious text as needing to acquire knowledge in some way, right, that could create a potential uh, problem, right, or contradiction. So um, there are a number of these issues that arise in philosophy of religion. Uh, some of them, you know, hinge on our basic notions of non-contradiction, but again, right, we want to be using that same sort of reasoning when applying it to our religious belief as anything else. And then another very uh, important and still very widely debated issue is the relationship that religion has or could have with science, right? So many people are under the unfortunate mistaken conception that these two disciplines um, or areas of knowledge are somehow incompatible, right? That in order to be religious, you have to be anti-science or something like this. And it's important to understand that this is not the case. Um, Pretty much every religious claim 
can be, at least in theory, tested, right, in a scientific manner, in an empirical manner. And so, you know, we, we have to be careful about picking and choosing when we want to appeal to that sort of evidence and when we don't. So, for example, you know, uh, you might be familiar with young Earth creationists, right, individuals who think that the world uh, is much younger than science would give us evidence to suppose it is, right, something like only 6,000 years old. And when young Earth creationists want to make certain claims, they might appeal to something like carbon dating, right, um, where they want to acknowledge that some biblical story has in fact occurred, right? They would use scientific methodology to prove, right, that there was perhaps a great flood. But then, on the other hand, when it is inconvenient, right, like the fact that carbon dating proves that the Earth is much, much older than 6,000 years, then all of a sudden that science becomes unreliable, right? So again, whatever our lens is for making these analyses, for assessing various claims, we want to make sure that we're being consistent, right? That we're not just engaging in some sort of confirmation bias. And this leads us to the discussion of belief and disbelief, right? So. In philosophy of religion, we can talk about the various claims that a religion makes, but we can also talk about what people believe. And there are a lot of terms that are used when discussing religious belief that are uh, misunderstood or used in synonymous ways when they actually mean different things. And so we're just going to clarify what these terms actually mean and how we're going to be using them in this class. So the term many people might be familiar with is that of a theist, right? So a theist is someone who believes in God, but you'll notice that there can be different um, uh, pre-qualifiers, right, that we can put on here. So you could be a monotheist, you could be a polytheist, right? Uh, there are different types of theism, but the idea here is that a theist is someone who has a positive belief, right? They believe in the existence of at least one divine entity. Right? And so this type of theism right, is going to be the personal belief in God. So a theist is relating to the person. The ism here is relating to the belief. On the other end of a theist is an atheist. right? So when we have the A in front of a word, it typically is involving a negation or denial of. right? So if theism is the belief in the existence of God, then an atheist is someone who denies the existence of God. So it's important to understand that both theism and atheism right, are beliefs. right? They are commitments to an existential claim, either a positive or a negative. Now, the next term that I'm going to introduce is one that often gets confused with atheist, but is in fact uh, entirely different, and that is the term agnostic. So if we think of beliefs more in the sense of a spectrum, as we should, because no one believes anything 100% or 0%, right? Belief, like most things, comes in degrees. Then we should understand theism to be at one end of the spectrum, atheism to be at the other end of the spectrum, and agnosticism to lie in the center, meaning that to be agnostic is to either withhold judgment entirely, right? So for instance, you could say, well, I just don't have enough information yet to decide whether or not I believe in God. So you could just be withholding your judgment for the time being, or you could simply be of the opinion that this is something we cannot know, right? So you are sort of committed to remaining an agnostic no, despite whatever information you encounter because you happen to believe that knowing God's existence is simply beyond our human understanding, right? Maybe it's just something that is, is too broad or infinite or complex um, an idea to, to ever be uh, capable of comprehending by the human mind, right? So we want to understand beliefs not as an all or nothing, right? So very few people are just entirely theists or entirely atheists, right? Most people lie somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, and it's important to understand also that those beliefs can change, not only over time, but even, you know, from day to day, right? So someone who maybe is um, leaning more towards theism, might be having, you know, experiencing some extreme hardships, and so their confidence level in their theism might go down, right? And they might be slide or sliding closer to agnosticism, or it could work the other way around, right? So just understand this as a spectrum of beliefs of which we move along, and that agnosticism lies in the central as a neutral belief. 
other ways of understanding agnosticism comes from the idea of uh, Richard Dawkins, who was a very famous philosopher of religion, and he gives us um, a little bit more of a a uh, series of terms that we could use if we wanted to capture perhaps where we are on this spectrum. And so this is a scale which involves notions like strong or weak adherence to theism or atheism, um, de facto, right, theist or de facto atheist, which involves, again, either a commitment, in this case, to not knowing, and then pure agnosticism in the middle. So feel free to take a look at these links if you want to know more about um, the specific terminology, but you could also just use that general sliding scale with those three terms. All right, so going into the different types of theism, right? So when we add a qualifier to the beginning, right, mono, right, mono means one, so monotheism is the belief in one God. But specifically, and this is something that's not always captured in our understanding of monotheism, is that monotheism is the belief in a personal God, right? This is going to be an important distinction from another term that's going to come up known as deism. Deism is the belief in a God, but one that is impersonal or who is not involved in our everyday affairs. So monotheism is not just a belief in one God, but the belief in a personal God, one that you can communicate with right, theoretically, given perhaps certain um, rituals or procedures, one that is, you could have a relationship with, right, one that is also likely to interrupt or become involved in human affairs, perhaps through the performance of miracles or something like this, right? So monotheism is not just the belief in one God, but the belief in a personal God. Whereas polytheism, right, poly meaning many, is the belief in many gods. Now, one of the interesting things about the polytheistic religions that we're going to look at, we'll come across them primarily in Hinduism, uh, later forms of Buddhism, right, which merged with uh, other indigenous traditions in the East, as well as First Nations or indigenous religions in the West, is that polytheism comes in many different types of forms, right, and means lots of different things. And so it's going to be... Um, Un helpful to understand some additional types of theism related to this. Uh, but before we get into those, again, the notion of deism is the idea that there is one God, but that God is impersonal in the sense that it is not going to get involved in your life. And so typically, deists believe that God created the world, right, set all of the laws of nature and everything in motion, and then sort of becomes hands-off, right, and is no longer involved, not going to be the kind of God that one could, uh, again, waste their time, they would consider it a waste of time to pray to, right, or to try to form a relationship with, right, this is not a personal God in this sense. But what's interesting about deism is that because it's a type of monotheism, you will find elements of deism throughout all of the Abrahamic religions. So there, you can be a Christian deist, you could be a Jewish deist, you could be a Muslim deist, right? So the idea here is that we're going to find aspects of deism in every monotheistic religion. The terms that I mentioned that are going to be related to polytheism are pantheism and panentheism. And so to help understand these, I have these diagrams here. Let's start with pantheism, right? So this is the view that God and the universe are one and the same thing, a divine whole. And the reason that this is related to polytheism is that when you talk about God and the universe being one and the same, that infinite quality of God in the universe can make it very difficult to develop a personal relationship with God, right? If you believe that God or gods are personal types of beings. And so polytheism as a branch of pantheism allows you to formulate an understanding of God that is a little bit more personal. So we're going to see this in Hinduism. So Hinduism is pantheist in the sense that Everything in the universe, including all of the gods, are in fact just different parts of one unified whole, right? And so we're going to learn the terminology of that whole, you know, when we study Hinduism. But the idea is that because everything is part of one unified whole, we can't really comprehend that with our limited mind. And so polytheism ends up being an instrument for us to develop a relationship with that pantheistic 
entity, right? So since I can't comprehend the entire universe, right, I will try to develop a relationship with one element of that divine universe, right? Perhaps one of the many gods. And someone else could develop a relationship with a different god, right? By a different name, a different face, a different set of characteristics. But that polytheism is pantheistic in the sense that the god I'm worshipping and the god someone else is worshipping are just different personalities or characteristics of the same divine entity, right? And so again, we'll get a better sense of what this looks like when we see uh, Hinduism. Another variation of polytheism is panentheism. This is the view that although God and the world are distinct, the world is a part of God. So in this sense, we have some divine entity or whole, which is distinct from the physical world that we live in. And the notion here is that our world, although conceptually distinct from God or many gods, is a part of God. And so the idea here is that that God, although distinct, can be found in various elements of the natural world. And so this, again, is something that we'll see most likely in indigenous traditions, where you would have um, references to various uh, spirits, right, that inhabit certain aspects of the natural world, right? So the idea um, is perhaps if we're looking at animistic polytheistic religions, that, you know, there is uh, a spirit in this particular animal, there is a spirit in this particular rock, there is a spirit in this river, right? And the idea is that there's the river, right, as we understand it, and then there is the spirit or the gods. Those are distinct, but we can understand that god or spirit as being present in the natural world. Right, so these are a little bit more complex, but just so that we can start to understand the many differences that we're going to see in polytheism and how these ideas relate to each other. All right, so going back to uh, different beliefs in God, right, it's interesting to note how belief in God has changed over time. And so I'm going to go through a, a series of statistics here with you. I would encourage you to take a look at the media as well about how this is, again, constantly changing, and start to ask yourself why these religious beliefs are changing. What is causing religious belief to change in this way? And so a Pew Research Center report, uh, as late as 2014, gave us the following statistics as compared to seven years prior about the percentage of American adults who either believe in God with absolute certainty, belief in God with just a fair amount of certainty, and then those who do not believe in God, right? So again, if we're looking at the terms that we learned about earlier, we consider a belief in God with absolute certainty to be a theist, those who do not believe in God to be an atheist, and then the middle category here would be somewhere in between agnosticism and theism, right? So they are fairly certain in their belief in God, but they're not as far over to the theist side of the spectrum as um, those in the other category. So note here again these numbers. So in 2017, 71% of people identified as being absolutely certain in their belief in God. In 2014, that number decreased to 63%. If we go over to the next category, we can see that the numbers increased between 20. 2007 and 2014, which means that not everyone is jumping over to the opposite end of the spectrum, right? It's not that theists are all of a sudden becoming atheists, but we do see a move on that spectrum, at least towards agnosticism. But again, for those who maybe began in the center towards agnosticism, we do see them too sliding to atheism, right, where we have an increase in atheism um, from 5% in 2007 to 9% in 2014. But if you take a look at the media that I've provided, you'll note that a lot of these numbers actually might be higher than are what are reported because um, many people are afraid 
or uh, worried about the potential retribution or pushback they will get if they were to admit that they are an atheist. And this comes from the unfortunate uh, belief that morality only can come from religion, right? That you can only be a good person if you have religious belief. And so because we associate those two things as necessarily connected, we think then that if you admit to not being religious or not believing in God, then that somehow implies that you must be a bad person, right? And so because of these uh, connections, right, people often are afraid to come out of what they might call the atheist closet, right? Um, this happens a lot, again, in the public sphere as well. You'll note that um, as far as uh, the history of the U.S. presidency concerns, we have never had um, a president who was anything but, you know, openly, f fervently religious. Um, the closest we came was in uh, 2016 Democratic primaries where we had our first uh, Jewish nominee, right, or potential candidacy in Bernie Sanders. But again, right, that is very rare and we have never seen someone raise uh, to the level of a serious candidate who admitted to being an atheist. Right, so it's still considered, again, to be somewhat of um, a taboo sort of set of beliefs. So I've included some other statistics here for you in addition to the Pew Center Research Report because it's, under, it's helpful to understand how these beliefs differ across different age ranges as well as different professions, right? So you'll note here in the bottom left chart that belief in God, right, has started to decrease for those between the ages of 18 to 29, right? So this is the idea that they never doubted the existence of God, but those numbers for the younger people are going down, which means they are starting to doubt the existence of God. We'll see that the numbers are, you know, relatively stable through the 30 to 49 year olds, the 50 to 64 year olds, and then the 65 and over. What's interesting, though, is when you look at this data more closely, you'll notice the common trends. One is separated on gender. So it is um, the case that women tend to be more religious than men, and that religiosity or one's commitment to your religion is at its highest between the ages of um, 20 and 35. And this, the idea here is that this is typically around the age when people are having children. And again, because of the association between religion and morality, it is thought that, okay, if you want, or if you're going to raise children, you want to instill good values in them, that is when people might become more entrenched in their religious tradition in order to educate their children about those values. You might think that religiosity would be at its peak as people get older, right? As they are perhaps approaching the end of their life. But interestingly, that's not the case. We actually start to see belief and religiosity decrease as people get older. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. I, I mean, we could definitely speculate about a few things, but right, some interesting statistics to note. On the right hand side here, right, we have a comparison between the scientific community and the general population, right? So it's important to note that Again, you do not have to be an atheist if you are a scientist, but there is still a large disparity between the uh, religious commitment of uh, scientific communities towards the general public, right? So, of course, the general population is going to be more religious than the scientific community, but that doesn't mean, again, that there are no scientists who are religious, right? Showing that there is a compatibility between these two things. And again, we might try to think about why this is, right? What is perhaps the reason? Is it um, a certain level of education, right, that correlates to religious belief? Is it, you know, looking at just whatever one's pre-existing beliefs were before they entered into a certain discipline, right? There are lots of things that we can look at here. So to continue on with this last set of numbers, right, we have um, in our textbook the idea that 51% of scientists believe in a deity or higher power. So you might be surprised at how high that is, right, for the scientific community. But again, relative to the general population, right, it's much lower. So between 80 and 95% of Americans believe in a high deity or power. So here I have a couple of quotes from some very well-known uh, scientists. 
So we have astrophysicist Carl Sagan, who started um, the, the first iteration of the show Cosmos, of which Neil deGrasse Tyson recently uh, did a remake. And he said, science is not only compatible with spirituality, is, is a profound source of spirituality, right? So here we're talking about someone who's, whose job is to study space, right? And look out into the world. And for him, he saw that as a source of religiosity or spirituality in the sense that, right, we're looking at the enormity of the universe. We're trying to comprehend our, our small space within it. And there's something that can be very welcoming towards religion in that sense. Here we also have Stephen Hawking. Um, who passed away a couple of years ago, but he too, uh, an immense uh, theoretical physicist who talked about not necessarily to the extent that Carl Sagan did, you know, about how science could be a source of spirituality, but that science need not go against religion, right? So he says here, what I have done is to show that it is possible for the way the universe began to be determined by the laws of science, right? And this is, of course, as being opposed to earlier scientific endeavors, which included various, um, you know, gaps in their understanding of which we often would call it the God of the gaps, right? So in early science, when there was an element of the universe or our understanding of certain laws of nature, where we couldn't find an empirical explanation yet, the idea is that that is where God would typically be inserted. And so what Stephen Hawking is saying is that we've just gotten to a point in our scientific understanding where we don't need to appeal to God anymore. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist, right? So evidence for one thing in this case is not gonna be evidence against in the case of God. So he says, in that case, it would not be necessary to appeal to God to decide how the universe began, but this doesn't prove that there is no God only that God is not necessary, again, for this explanation. All right, so some other terms that are going to be helpful for our understanding in philosophy of religion is the difference between philosophy of religion and theology. So you, these are two different areas of study, but they're often confused because they tend to answer the same types of questions. So the difference between them are their respective starting points. So both theologians and philosophers of religion will, again, talk about whether or not God exists, what that God is like, you know, how we can understand that to impact our understanding of the world, perhaps in the nature of uh, evil, what this means for us personally as for whether or not we have a soul, whether or not there's an afterlife, right, and so on and so forth. So even though they're both answering these same questions, a theologian will not count as a philosopher in the sense that they are already starting by presuming a certain religion and thus its doctrines or beliefs are true, right? So a theologian would answer, right, the question of whether or not God exists by already presuming a certain religion is true, right? So if we're dealing with a Buddhist theologian, right, from the earlier traditions, which were atheistic, right, that theologian would not count as a philosopher because they already presume that no God exists, as opposed to perhaps a Christian or Muslim theologian, right, who would start from the presumption that not only does a God exist, but one God exists, and they already have a pretty good sense of what that God is like from their sacred religious texts. So how is philosophy of religion different? In philosophy, we are not allowed to take anything for granted, right? So we cannot start off by just assuming some set of beliefs or doctrines are true. So if you are a Christian theologian, for example, who wants to do philosophy of religion, you would first have to start by proving that a God exists, then prove that the type of God exists is one God and that it has the characteristics, right, that are ascribed to them in those sacred texts, right, in the Bible and the older, the New Testament. Okay, so the difference again is our starting points. We're not presuming that anything is true right off the bat in philosophy of religion. We have to start from scratch and then move towards those arguments for your specific religious tradition. Whereas a theologian will already start by presuming 
that their scripture and religious texts include the truth, right? And assuming those truths, they will then try to answer those questions. So if you're interested in theology, right, it's important to know that, again, these there are different types of theology, some of which are closer to philosophy than others. And so this is the difference between revealed and natural theology. So going back to our earlier discussion of religious experience, revealed theology is the idea that we can answer the questions that theologians are interested in, but the knowledge that we are going to get to answer those questions can only come from divine revelation. So this would include um, a personal religious experience or some sort of testimony from someone else's religious experience, right, as we would get in scripture. Natural theology, on the other hand, is closer to philosophy of religion because it's going to use the rules of logic. So if you get into philosophy of religion, you know, one of the, you know, probably most prominent philosophers that you'll discover is uh, Thomas Aquinas, and he would be considered a natural theologian, right? Because he does adhere to the tenets of Christianity, but he does philosophy in the sense that he's not just going to be starting off by assuming that all the doctrines in Christianity are true. He's first going to argue that God exists, that it is one, a single God, and later on that that God must have the qualities, right, that are ascribed to. And so he's going to be using, right, the laws of logic and reason to demonstrate that knowledge, right? So natural the theology in this case ends up being the closest to philosophy of religion, right? So it's both combining philosophy as well as one's theological commitments. All right, some other terms that are going to be important as we enter into our discussions are different types of beings. So this is going to be important when we're arguing for the existence of a god or gods because gods by their very nature exist in a different way. They are a different type of thing than humans are, right, or other living things that we encounter on a regular basis. And so in this sense, we're going to introduce the terms necessary and contingent existence. So starting off with a contingent being, that is beings like us, right? We are beings that exist, but it is possible for us not to have existed, right? Our existence is contingent upon some other set of circumstances, right? So for example, if your parents had not met when they did, I know we don't like to think about this, but if they had not procreated at the time that they did, you would not have been born, right? So you didn't have to exist. A number of things could have gone differently and then you would not have existed. And that's the same for pretty much everything in the physical world, right? I'm looking at my cat right now. She is a contingent being, right? She could easily have not existed, right? As well as the chair that she's sleeping on, right? Certain things could have happened that would have reasonably amounted to their lack of existence. And so in terms of logic, what that means is that if we were to say that you don't exist, we are not creating any sort of contradiction, right? Or that you could have not existed. We're not creating any sort of contradiction, right? So we all exist contingently. It is possible for us to have not existed. So all physical things are contingent, and this is going to be different from what we are going to ascribe to divine beings as necessary existence, right? So God or gods are meant to exist necessarily in the sense that they not only should have always existed, but it would have been impossible for them not to have existed, right? And so this is the idea that if God exists, God must exist. And so when we deny the existence of God, we are potentially creating a contradiction, right? So if God is a necessary being, if you were, say, an atheist and you said God didn't exist, you would be contradicting yourself because the meaning of God includes the, necess the necessity of its existence. So you're basically saying a being that exists necessarily doesn't exist, which is a contradiction. All right, so this leads us into uh, Ninian Smart's uh, paper about the various dimensions of religion. And I'm not going to spend, you know, too much time going through each of the dimensions, but I do want to highlight what he, he's doing 
in this paper and how we should use these dimensions right in our work. So first things first, Ninian Smart was a Scottish writer and professor and he is, was the founder of secular religious studies, so secular meaning non-religious. And so what this means is that prior to Ninian Smart, you could not in higher education study religion unless you were a member of that religious tradition and most commonly you were going to devote your life to that religion, right? That you were going to be entering uh, the ministry or whatever that religion's version of the ministry is. So because of, of his work, we're able to have classes like now where you don't have to be a part of any particular religion to study any of the world's religions. And so he established the first Department of Religious Studies in the UK. All right, so his main point in this paper has to do with the issues that came from defining religions earlier. And so you're going to see this in some of the media, specifically about the uh, Tylorian and Durkheimian, those are just long words for the names, right, Tyler and Durkheim, who had the most prominent definitions of religion before, right? And these respectively were, in order to count as a religion, you have to have some belief in the divine, right, a higher supernatural entity, or in order to count as a religion, you had to believe in the sacred. But as you're going to learn, both of those definitions are problematic either because they're too broad, as in the case with the sacred, right? Because then if being religion just counts something as sacred, well, sports would be a religion, right? Because there are lots of things that are considered in, sacred in sports. Or, um, you know, nationalism or patriotism, right? Thinking that the flag is sacred or a certain set of documents, right? That these in and of themselves, right, are obviously not religions, but if we use that definition, would count as such. So that's too broad of a definition. On the other hand, right, saying that to be a religion requires one to believe in a supernatural entity is too narrow in the sense that it disqualifies really non-Western religious traditions, right? So primarily, again, we're thinking here of Taoism and Buddhism, especially in its earlier forms where it was atheistic or non-theistic, right, not positing uh, the existence of supernatural entities. So this is too narrow in that these very obviously should count as religions, but wouldn't under this definition. And so Ninian Smart is trying to deal with this problem, right? Since we don't have a good working definition of religion at this time, right? We want to figure out another way of characterizing religion so that we can study them. And you might think, why is this important? Why do we need to have a definition of religion? Well, Surely, right, there are going to be practical implications of what counts as a religion. So, for example, perhaps you've seen um, the documentary Glo Going Clear about Scientology, right? So this is um, a, a newer quote-unquote religion in the sense that it was finally designated as a religion by the IRS and thus gets a lot of benefits, right, and tax breaks and exemptions qualifying itself as a religion. And then, of course, there are the more personal um, and perhaps worrisome elements of what counts as a religion, as opposed to perhaps a cult, right, which you'll see uh, coming up in our first discussion, right? So what counts as a religion is going to be really important, both for individuals, right, and for the larger society. And so it's going to be important to understand what is going to count as a religion and why. And so Ninian Smart's approach is to avoid this problem altogether. So he's not going to try to give you just a definition of what religion is. Instead, he's going to give us a set of dimensions. So you can think of this like a checklist, right? In order to be a religion, you have to have all of these things. And he's going to separate these dimensions into two broad categories, the parahistorical dimensions and the historical dimensions. And the important thing to understand about these two is that the different dimensions in these two categories will depend upon whether or not you have to be a part of that religion in order to fully understand that dimension. So parahistorical dimensions refer to those e experiences and inner lives of the practitioners. So this means that in order to understand the parahistorical dimensions of a religion, you have to be part of it, right? So there's going to be a difference between observing someone in prayer and being 
in prayer, right? And that there's something about experiencing prayer that's going to give you a fuller, more in-depth understanding of that dimension of religion, as opposed to just watching it from the outside. So these parahistorical dimensions include the practical and the ritual. I'll let you take a look at these. The experiential and emotional. The narrative and mythical. Right? So these are the ideas that we only get a full comprehension of by participating in the religion. There's, there's some elements of it that we can learn from the outside, but not to the extent that someone immersed in that religion would have. The other set of dimensions, on the other hand, are historical dimensions. And this is really important because these can be studied empirically, and as a result, you could potentially be outside of a religious tradition and know more about the historical dimensions than someone in that religion. And unfortunately, that happens more often than you would think, right? A lot of people who ascribe to a certain religious tradition don't really have a very uh, full or in-depth understanding of its history, right? Or of its broader doctrines. And so these are the ones that we're going to be focusing on, right, primarily because they can be studied empirically from a secular perspective and can be known just as well, if not better than, those who are practitioners. So these historical dimensions include the doctrinal and philosophical, right, so these are the systematic formulations of religious teachings in an intellectually coherent form, i.e. using logic, right, and they're going to provide rational explanation for the types of practices and ideas, right, that we saw in the parahistorical dimension, right? So if we're looking at perhaps why you need to perform a ritual in a certain way, what purpose a narrative or a mythic account is having, right, these are going to be connected to this doctrinal and philosophical justification. Okay, so by doctrines, right, we're just referring to the beliefs about certain entities, whether they be divine or natural, that exist in the world and the relationship between the two, right? So by doctrines, we're talking about sets of beliefs about the things that exist and their relationships to one another. Other historical dimensions are going to include the ethical and legal. This too runs into the realm of philosophy in the sense that we're going to look at what the connection is between religion and ethics. Right? But the idea here is that the religion is seen as prescribing a certain set of rules about human behavior, of which then communities can then use someone's adherence to those rules to either shame them or praise them. Right, So it's often these tools uh, or these rules end up becoming tools, instruments for maintaining a certain religious community. The next one is social and institutional, right? So this has to do with the groups or organizations, right, which are used to keep um, communities of religious individuals together. It's also how these religions perpetuate themselves, right, the, how they make themselves continue. I know this is um, one of the challenges that the Catholic Church is experiencing right now, is that while we might not see a decline in Christianity writ large, Catholicism is having a particularly hard time attracting young people, right? So the idea is that there's something about the institution or the social community that is not as appealing to younger generations, right? And so this is going to be something that the religion will want to address because they're going to want to see their, their traditions continue. These institutions and social communities can also involve specific places of worship, right, whether they be at church, temple, mosque, monastery, whatever it is. And this has to do with the final dimension, which was added after the first six, and this is the material dimension, right? So these are the objects that can symbolize either the sacred or the supernatural, right? And they can be very vast in their variety, right? But they are associated with the religion, right, by representing or symbolizing certain important facets. Okay, so how do we want to use these ideas, right, the seven dimensions? Again, we want to use it as a sort of checklist. So if we're looking at something, trying to figure out if it should count as a religion, we want to see if it has each of these seven things. But ironically, 
the problems with the Durkheimian and Tylorian definitions of religion are going to emerge for Ninian Smart as well, in that things like nationalism, Marxism, probably even sports too, right, might have all of these seven dimensions. And so he's going to add secretly like an eighth dimension. And this is the idea that in order to be considered a religion, the people who participate in it have to consider it a religion. Right, and so this is what will help disqualify Marxism, nationalism, sports, etc., as counting as religions, because within nationalism and Marxism, there is a strong strain of anti religious sentiment, right? Or in the case of nationalism, right, religion can often be seen as competing with dedication to the nation. Right? And so, again, a sort of secret eighth dimension is that the people participating in it need to consider it a religion.